code, your PHP files, inside your own uh, laptop uh, and not have everything ported over to your uh, server, which could lead to the fact that it's not my component anymore because you bring it up, then you have lost your files. Um, however, this might be different for every project member on your, uh, your project because the path to your local folder might be different. So how do we allow to configure uh, that while still providing users with a simple setup script? Well, you can easily, uh, in your vacant file, add two lines, specify the path to the file, which has a configuration, and of course you require the apples to be applicable. Then if you implement that in your vacant files, it's on two lines, you've got your common variable available inside your main configuration. Now, if you want to set up your shared folder, you can actually get really easy use your configuration, share folder key or whatever key you give it. Your whole configuration will be loaded here from a simple JSON file. This allows it also to localize, for instance, the name because someone might have different, uh, might want to give it a different name or has a not so good laptop and has to use less memory or a better laptop and use more memory. You can even uh, define the IP on which your uh, virtual box will be uh, accessible. It helps with, uh, 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 the, the, for instance, you can have multiple virtual boxes next to each other, multiple development images, and they can communicate to each other because they have different IPs. So for your basic configuration of your vagrant file, uh, it's important to have uh, a standardized vagrant file, which nobody should touch anymore once it's been written. And you should commit that to your virtual control system. It should be at the root of your project so that when someone checks it out, you've got your configuration file available. At the same time, you've got your local configuration. So <coughs> you need to have a simple configuration and commit that to your virtual control system as well. At the same time, you should allow them to ignore any development configuration that the person itself makes. So that uh, if I give it a different IP than my colleague, it's not shared between the two, but you have to actually have a local configuration. So once you're done, you've got your basic configuration set up, you can build your image. All you require, all you are required to do is actually run one command, vagrant up. Then start building the image, import your base box, which you define with your name, configure it for you with the shared folders, with the FP, with the memory limit, and all, all everything you've configured uh, it to do, and it's running. You've got your local development image up and running. It's accessible, it works, you can SSH into it, but it's not usable as a server. Machine. However, it's not a server. And if it's not a server, we certainly do not want everyone to install everything themselves. I mean, that kind of defeats the purpose. So afterwards, you can get into provisioning. This is the next step. Provisioning is actually your configuration management of your stack. It allows you to use your infrastructure as a code. You can define your infrastructure in code. And since it's in code, you can commit it to your virtual control system again which makes it really reusable because, again, it's inside your project. Once you check out your project from your version control, you've got everything you ever want to need. So Vagrant uh, actually provides the tools for you to use provisioning. It supports various provisioning tools, for instance, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Salt. However, that does require the installation of additional Ruby gem. And, of course, you can just write custom shells and use those as provisioners as well. Because there are way too many tools to cover in one talk, I'm just going to focus on one, and that's going to be Chef. Chef is a really simple tool that helps you do the provisioning really easy, really fast. <coughs> uh, there's a lot to be said. There are a lot of discussions on the internet on Puppet versus Chef. They're the same tools. They're doing the same job. It's no use to compare them. So, Chef. What is Chef itself? Well, as the maintainers of uh, describe it, it's an infrastructure automation framework. Basically, uh, they provide two different versions. You've got Chef Server, in which there is one master server which dictates to all its nodes um, how their configuration should look like. The nodes can think to the server, hey, has something changed? If so, we'll apply it ourselves. Um, for the basis of the talk, this is a bit out of scope again because it's just too much to cover in a single talk. There's also a Chef Solo version, which just runs locally. You only have to install it once. Vagrant does it for you. And you can start using Chef and all the power of Chef with it. So what are the core concepts of Chef? Well, for Chef, you can write cookbooks. Cookbooks are the, the basics of your uh, installation. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll get more in depth into it in a bit. At the same time, you can describe uh, 
roles. Roles can be used to deploy the same configuration to different environments. Why use different roles for that? Well, maybe there are slightly different uh, setups. For instance, the root passwords of your MySQL installation might differ between the environments. Those kind of things can all be configured through your roles. So in order to build a chef cookbook, what is a cookbook? A cookbook is a fundamental unit of configuration and policy distribution in Chef. Their definition is not mine. I would just describe it as a definition of how to install what and where it should be installed on your local development. It's a bit easier and a bit quicker to understand. Again, there's a great community behind it, and there are a lot of sample cookbooks available. The main source will be community.com slash cookbooks. There's a wealth of cookbooks. Last time I checked, there were almost 850 different cookbooks, and it installs all sorts of software for you. So the Apache Engine X, PHP, MySQL, Postgres, but also Node or, or whatnot. Whatever you need is there. It's available. So how does a cookbook look? Well, a cookbook has a pre-existing structure. The basic structure of a cookbook is a single folder where a cookbook should be re replaced with the name of your cookbook or what you're going to be installing. For instance, the Apache cookbook will be called Apache. Inside a cookbook, you have three main folders. The attributes folders, the recipes folder, the templates folder. So what are those folders? Well, attribute files are basically the parents you're going to be using. What paths do I need to install them? Or which users do I need to install them? Uh, where do I get my, ba my basic files, my binaries or, or, or my uh, JIT uh, files? Where do I get everything? The recipes are the Ruby code that needs to be <coughs> in order to install the software on your development page. The templates are basically Template files. They're just literally configuration files. For instance, your MySQL configuration can be written in a template, and through your recipes, you can make certain attributes available inside your template and then copy the file over to your development and make sure that your MySQL configuration completely set up and ready for you to use. Basically, this provides you with a simple MVC structure where the attributes can be regarded as models, the templates as the views, and the recipes as the controls. So a chef role. What is a chef role? Again, they've got a really quirky definition. A, a role is a way to define certain patterns and processes that exist across nodes and chef organizations belonging to a single job function. As I described it, this is a collection of cookbooks and attributes that should be used. That's all there is to it. A chef role is nothing more than a plain and simple JSON file. It has some required attributes, it has a lot of attributes you can add or not. But the main parts are you should give it a name. A role should have a name. Ideally, you name it after the environment you're going to be using for. So a good name would be, for instance, development, test, staging, acceptance, uh, production. Then you can set some default attributes for those uh, roles. Default attributes are um, attributes that the recipes require and that differ per role, so that you wouldn't set up in your main configuration. Override attributes are attributes that the recipes themselves define, in the, or the cookbooks themselves define in the, attributes, in the attributes files. However, you want to override them. For instance, you might want to install uh, solar on a different path than what they originally intended it to be installed in. There you can override the attributes and be done with. And lastly, and most importantly, you can provide it with a run list. A run list is nothing more than all the cookbooks you should run. You want to run on your installation to get your development image up and running. So a shared role allows for a per environment configuration of setup. As a basic example, I'll provide you with an example of a simple Apache PHP in my scroll stack. I mean, the L of the LAMP stack is already being built by Vagrant, so we don't do the M part of the LAMP stack. The simplest example is basically this. For a development environment, <coughs> don't override any default uh, attributes. You don't want to uh, override any attributes defined by the cookbooks themselves. And as a run list, you just want to install Apache 2 with more PHP because it's paid. You're going to run PHP, you install PHP, and you install MySQL. So, how do you get this inside your Vagrant? How do you make Vagrant aware of the fact that it should run this? Well, Vagrant requires at least three definitions. You should set up a path from the Vagrant <laughs> file towards your cookbook path. Where can it find the cookbook for Chef? Same applies for the roles, because if you're going to define a role or a cookbook, you need to know where to find it. There's no standardized way to use it, but I'd recommend using a deploy folder with uh, chef scripts and your different roles in there and everything, so everything is bundled inside the same deploy folder. <coughs> so, 
What have we got so far? Well, we've got a consistent virtual machine with a known operating system. We define it by our base box that we're using. We define the box we're using inside our vagrant file. And that gives us a consistent OS that everyone knows and use and should use. At the same time, we provide the whole stack for everyone. That means that every developer can have a standardized stack. So where do you keep all this? You keep it inside your project. You commit, the, commit it to the version control system your project is using. That means that once you check out your project again, you have everything you're ever going to need. I see a duplicate the slide here. Uh, there's a lot more to Chef as well. You can actually uh, write custom cookbooks. Custom cookbooks can be really, really useful. I mean, <coughs> you might not just want to get <coughs> uh, software. You might also want to populate your database. For instance. You want to have a specific database user for your application to use. You don't want to use it as the root user. If you want to have different databases, you can set, up, set it up here. If you want to uh, migrate a complete schema or whatever, just write a simple uh, cookbook. It's really simple. You can run a template to run the code. You can invoke the template, and you're done. You could also use it to uh, provide the fixtures if you're going to have a test environment where you actually can build your virtual machine. You can have uh, import all the fixtures, and you can be done with it. It's, it's basically everything you're going to need for your test environment. Furthermore, you can have some file generation. Um, some applications, for instance, one all application uh, I'm working on as a per environment local configuration file on PHP. However, that still has some uh, configuration parameters, and I don't want to write that file myself every single time you have to deploy to an environment or have to update or whatever. So we can write a simple cookbook. We can define our, uh, our attributes inside the cookbook or inside the role, which will even be better, because then you can, again, make it environment agnostic. Role defines what should be done uh, inside the cookbook. So, do we remember this shot, this sheet, fourth step? Well, there is no fourth step anymore. It's literally step one to three. Get the ghost formula for a version control system, copy your configuration sample, add that if need be, and you can run Vagrant up, and then you're done. It's literally this. You can clone your digital project, you copy one file, you run Vagrant up, and the machine starts building. Now, do know that the first time your machine is building, it needs to install all the software, it needs to import the base box, it needs to boot your uh, OS. So it can take some time. I mean, this could take 15 minutes, half an hour if you've got a complicated setup. But afterwards, you've got a machine that's ready to go. So once we've got a development image, ideally, we spread the exact same setup to our uh, test, staging, or acceptance, and production environments. For uh, doing this, there are, of course, automated deployment tools. There are a lot of automated deployment tools, Fing, Capistano, Webistrano, Epiphany, both variants of Capistano, Fabric, Lab Deployer, and probably a few more I forgot about. That. So normally, you uh, use these tools to create a backup of your files, you to, to, run the, uh, to deploy your new version of your code, and um, to, to run any database migrations, or uh, re-index solar, or whatever you need to do in order to deploy your application successfully. That gets now an intermediate step. Between the creation of the backups and the actual deploy, you should build an or update your environment. You should actually use the exact same tools you use for a development environment. That's also the key part here, why you should uh, embed all your uh, chef and favorite code within your project. It makes it really easy to, on every environment, rebuild the same environment. However, what if your production environment has been dictated upon you? Well, if uh, the hosting party says, well, OK, we only run PHP 5.3.1. That's what you should use. Well, then configure your tools to reflect your production environment. Make sure your development environment is always 100% in sync with your uh, production environment. That means you can use the version locking, and you can uh, completely and 100% recreate your production environment locally. To make sure you have no uh, discrepancies between the two environments and prevents the bugs from, hey, this works on my laptop, it works on my development image even, it works on his development image, but not in production. There might be a different version of PHP running, which doesn't support trades, for instance. As a simple recap, you should use the development image. You should always use development images that are the most portable ways, it's consistent, you can use it throughout your team. It's really important to do this. Yes, it takes time to set up. 
can get into every parse where you need to write a lot of custom code if your application demands it or if your stack demands it. But it pays it off in the long run. If a new team member gets bored, it takes them 30 minutes to get up from, hey, this is the project, this is the, the repository, now we can get started with fixing bugs or uh, making a cool new feature. But the second uh, step you should automate your deployment. And once you automate your deployment, you should use provisioning for every employment. Now, I would go into more detail about the automated deployment. However, <laughs> there's a talk following just about that. So I've uh, left a bit out. So are there any questions about this? Nobody? No questions? OK, thank you. Again, please give me any feedback. You can ping me on Twitter or just uh, approach me, whatever. Please give me any feedback you have. Thank you. Okay, we will have a short 30 minute break now. Uh, yes. Yes. Do you have some feedback? 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 Do over het scherm heen ligt. Uh, dus ik probeer om wat meer de tekst te groeperen. En anderzijds, ik heb gezien dat je bepaalde URL's, uh, zoals ik bijvoorbeeld dat ik een helemaal onderaan van het scherm zet. Ja, dat was meer uh, gewoon een <coughs> source geven. Ja, dat je zeggen van uh, ja, die kun je beter vinden. Misschien ook in dat beter op de slide zelf gezet van hey, die haal ik beter vandaan. Maar ja, meer want, van uh, op de PC ga je nog merken dat mensen achterin dat niet kunnen doen. Oké, okay, dat is goed. Dat is ook wel iets om te doen. We proberen om de content zoveel mogelijk in. In de schermtouw. Ja, eigenlijk moet je het zo zeggen, in de bovenste helft eigenlijk, uh, moet je eigenlijk uh, proberen zoveel mogelijk te doen. Oké. Okay. Ja, ik heb die, uh, die links onderaan van namelijk gewoon als, als ja. uh, attributions, want daar heb ik iets vandaan. Ja, dat is niet zo. Ik geef het, ik geef het. Ja, ja, graag. Ja. 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 Anders? Vast wel. Alsjeblieft. Ja, een uh, aantal dingetjes. Volgens mij heeft de afdraaide zenuw in het begin. Maar uh, ik mis een pauzes. Uh, ik zeg maar de constante stroom van woorden. <laughs> en, ik denk dat, en ik denk dat het echt een goede, goed moment om even een adempauze te nemen is als je een vraag stelt. Dus vraag, oké, okay, maar hoe zeg, zetten we dat dan op? Pauze en dan de vraag pas beantwoorden. Dat zorgt denk ik voor wat rust. En uh, dat maakt het fijn om te ja, ik zat ook even, ik zou net zeggen, wat snel ging. Ik zat de tijd in de gaten te houden. Ik dacht dat ik maar een half uur had. En uh, als je niet. <lacht> ja, ik, ben, ik was 27 minuten bezig. Dus op dat opzicht was ik net iets te snel. En ik heb een deel uit mijn talk weggelaten. Dus ik wist niet precies hoe ik uit zou komen qua tijd. Dus ik oh, okay. uh, een beetje snel tot doorheen fietsen. Maar ik zal dan proberen wat meer uh, rust in te bouwen. En dat is weer een Ja, het het was echt, uh, volgens mij zit daar alles in, ook de VGW weet je niet beter en ook de chef weet je niet beter. En, uh, maar ja, als je het zo compleet wil uh, doen, dan zijn er nog wel twee dingetjes die je zou kunnen toevoegen. Ja. Wat ik zelf merk wat super fijn is, dat je v spatie in SSH doet. Ja. Dus je zegt v up en dan heb je een box. En v SSH eronder als commando, dan heb je ook nog zeg maar en je moet gelijk ja. En uh, volgens mij was er bijna ook wel een stap vier. Namelijk dat je. De documentatie anders <laughs> passen. De, nee, ja, dat is een heel verhaal. De Etsy host. Dus je hem daar ja. bij zet. Ja, 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 ja. Dat, maar dat is ook weer voor je eigen convenience. Ja. Maar dat is wel heel makkelijk te zijn. Dat ja, zijn dat twee dingen. Ja. Maar voor de rest dat volgens mij alles erin. Oh, dank je. Naar de raar van was. Oh my. The questions are over. Wat is het dat practices are for uh, sorting your code for project? Would you like recommend like do a git sub module or like uh, check them in with your project? Or it, it, like, it really depends on the setup you're using as a company as a whole. I mean, if you've got a reusable cookbooks uh, you've created for your project, I mean, there's a, there's a wealth of cookbooks out there. Uh, I know I've adapted a few for our uh, uh, use cases, uh, but I do have noticed that. Yeah, cookbooks should be stored somewhere centrally. And then we got you could use Chef Server and Knife and uh, Notes. However, that's a bit more tricky to set up. It requires more maintenance, more management. So a GitSub module is, is a perfect uh, 
come from hospital too, actually. So yeah, it makes really uh, watch your library, you could what you use as a company. They can just look and so uh, get some JIT submodule. That was it. So yeah, I'd definitely go with that. Ik heb gewoon een kleintje, zeg maar van. Uh, ja, ik weet, ik weet dat. Ik weet dat van, het zou gewoon een shell scriptje zijn of zo, maar dat je inderdaad gewoon dit wil. Dit, dit zou een recipe zijn of zo. Dat dan hebben mensen wat meer uh, voorstellingen bij, denk ik. Ja, misschien ook wel even een custom cookie te zijn. Gewoon niet simpel, gewoon een hele andere voorstelling. Het zit een beetje met punten ga je een beetje in op de hoogie. Uh, het hele verhaal ja. achter en die chefcommando's. En, want, want, dan je weer een beetje magie erin. Ja, maak je bij je executie. Ja, wow! Ik zal ook kijken, dat is sowieso niet. Misschien ook wat meer graphics, I mean. Ja, dat weet ik, dat, uh, dat zat ik al bij. Dat zei ik gisteren ja, nog tegen je of hij deed ook. Wat meer graphics erin. Ja, je kan, uh, zoals iedereen, uh, chef van de uh, Muppet Show gebruiken. Ja, precies. Maar je kan bijvoorbeeld ook uh, chef van de South Park. Ga je vragen of het stond die volgt? Inderdaad. Okay. Nou ja, dat, dat was iets waar ik sowieso nog uh, aan wilde werken. Het is niet Final Version, het is een try dus, uh, Wil je nog een beetje? Ja, ik weet het wel. Ja. 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 Maar uh, misschien moeten we er zeker mee bij komen. Want het, is, het wordt nu ook heel, heel glad, heel statisch. Het blijft elke keer dezelfde zwarte tekst met de witte achtergrond. Ik zat ook te denken, misschien dat jullie daar ook te bellen om de headers over een andere kleur te geven. Want dat maakt het wat meer distinguishable. metro <laughs> Ja, ik denk dat dat mogelijk is. Als je naar het water snel hoort, denk ik dat het leuk is. Maar de, de, in de structuur, de inhoud is ook goed. De, alleen de, de overgang tussen de chapters zou je inderdaad uh, ja, ja, wat meer kunnen punctueren met een vraag of een pauze. Ja, wat, wat is het vrij? Op een gegeven moment zeg je, uh, wat hebben we nu? En uh, uh, die, die kan je misschien vaker doen. Dus van oké, okay, waar zijn we nu? En wat hebben we verder nog nodig aan het gaan doen? Dus, weet je wel, dat is eigenlijk de enige soort rust voor je En nu, dan is het minder door. Dat is eigenlijk de rust. Ik heb een cheeky trick aan je gedaan. Dus ik heb een really pretty uh, red hat on slide. Ja. Yeah. Dus find a couple more places for those. And also, I'll just give you a little more color. Ja. Yeah. You need a syntax highlight or something like that. That's a little pain. Ja, I'm not going to use syntax highlight. I'm going to use script for it, but it's also copy paste. Okay. Now, uh, I definitely need to work in the mission. But it's a little cool, yeah. But it's like a. Ja, je hebt het wel in, maar alleen echt aan drie kwart en dan is het geloof ik vijf of zes uur zo. Ja, je moet inderdaad wat meer, uh, minder een blijf van woorden en wat meer afgebakende stukjes. Ja, je hebt een mooie opdeling. Oké, is oké. Okay, okay. Nu weten we dat we een moeten willen. Oké, okay, we moeten een aanplikken. Oké, okay, nu hebben we vervelend. Wat willen we dan nog verder? Nu willen we dit. Dat geeft een stukje, nu wil ik de M van hem. Wat zit je in die drie kwart van de chef ook? Terwijl het eigenlijk begint kan zeggen, oké, okay, dat wil ik nu doen, maar ze weten. Ja. Het is content blijft allemaal hetzelfde. Alleen die vlucht zit. Dat weet ik eerst zelf. Volgens mij moet je bij het begin een context stellen van waar die op toch opleven. Die goals. Ja, dat is het. Wat zijn het van de Ja, dat, dat zat meer een beetje verborgen in dat uh, verhaaltje. Van, uh, dit is hoe het ging, dit is waar we naartoe willen. Ja. Maar ik wil nog een vraag over. Ja? Dan moet je op die laptop al hebben staan. Dat ik weet niet, ik weet niet dat 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 het is echt zijn tijd om in het einde van uw vak te zien zo'n development machine op te starten. Ik denk dat het is. Ja, ik denk wel. Ik heb er nog een naast te denken om inderdaad eentje te laten bouwen. Maar het probleem daarmee is, ze hebben eigenlijk allemaal verbinding met internet nodig. Daar kun je niet zo uit gaan. Pre-record! Ja. Nee, it works. Ja, wellicht, wellicht. Ik heb hem laatst in Gent uh, ook gedaan, nu in het vreemd. En daar had ik hem uh, wel kunnen starten. Alleen moest ik gewoon de achtergrond eventjes laten booten. Ondertussen mijn verhaal verder doen. En toen die eenmaal gestart was. Uh... Ja, het, punt, het probleem daarmee is dat ik uh, op een gegeven moment voor het NFS gebruik dat die administrator uh, access krijgt. Dus ik moet mijn wachtwoordje gaan vullen. 
Ja, die is niet veel leuk. Maar misschien in dat pre-recording. Ja, maar, 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 maar een van de leuke dingen van pre-recording is, is dat je bijvoorbeeld, eh, zeker wanneer je dan alles aan het downloaden is, dan kan je dat segment kan je gewoon even uh, het maal 20 doen. En dan uh, is het voor de viewer, of voor de mensen, die, die, die gaan we gewoon hebben, zo, oh, dan gaan we een snel. Maar het grote voordeel is, uh, ja, je bent continu eigenlijk aan het uh, engage met uh, de, de, de mensen, de audience, uh, door alles pre-recorder te hebben. Uh, je weet, je hebt geen uh, dependency op internet, je hebt geen dependency op latency en al die zaken meer. Uh, als jouw uh, systeem is uh, op dat moment uh, de lucht aan het doen is, je kent het niet. Dan sta je daar zo van, oh ja. Het geeft wat normaal zien, maar die minuten, ja, die duurt, duurt nu even vijf minuten. Dus mensen willen dat. Dat kan je niet maken. Dus alles gewoon even lekker spelen ja. uh, Ik doe dat eigenlijk al sinds uh, een jaar of twee. Uh, het het gaat wel goed. Gebruik ik, uh, ik gebruik daar uh, I show you HD voor. I show you HD. Ja, dat is een uh, MacBook. Ja. Ja. <laughs> Dit is voor iets anders. <laughs> Het werkt voor de screen recording. Ja, ik heb het toevallig een testklasje of zo. Dus. Ik heb nog een voorstel. Dus ik zou iets zoals dat net gezegd is. Proberen een soort leidraad structuur te bieden. En dat kan dan gekoppeld worden aan die eventueel. Uh, de graphics, als je bijvoorbeeld op een stuk van je scherm uh, zegt van ja, nu hebben we de vrije machine, dan zet je daar gewoon een afdeling van een van de vrije machine. Dan gaan we daar de, de operating system bij zetten, dan zetten we daar uh, een operating system icoon bij, dan zetten we daar de A en B stack uh, bij op, dan zetten we die daar ook bij. En zo zien de mensen die figuur van heel uw stack met je virtuele machine, eigenlijk stap voor stap groeien. Uh, en altijd op dezelfde plaats houden. En dan moet je gelang je talk eigenlijk vervorderen. Uh, zie je meer en meer heel je, je, je virtuele machine groeien. Dat is misschien een idee. Ja. Uh, het maakt het ook graag. Je hebt altijd, altijd een hou vast. Uh, je krijgt uh, een belangrijke e-mail binnen. En je ziet, ah ja, oké, okay, nu sta je uh, ineens uh, mijn, 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 mijn AMP stak erbij. Je ziet dat direct. Dan gaat het weer misschien 30 seconden talk gemist. Uh, uh, dat is goed. Ik heb nog ook een rebuild voor je nou als je dat moet doen. Maar we hebben dat ding in één keer aan het begin van het project, en dan heeft hij gewoon een hele Het is een half uur best wel een virtual machine, dus je kunt hem gewoon pauzeren, het zwart te stoppen. Ja, we kunnen nog even van hier op bak gooien met de partij weg, die heeft een half uur gehad. Ik heb voor het project van de Blueprint, heb ik hem eenmalig in het begin gepakt, en dat is dus wel echt een aantal keer gewoon weggooien. Opnieuw proberen te maken, weg voor je opnieuw proberen te maken. Dat is dus gewoon echt het opzetten van je twee van die chef verhaal. Ja, oké, okay, maar als je gewoon de, de, de tweede de wel is het eenmalig bouwen en dan ben je klaar. Ja, ik denk dat je een beetje in mijn week zoekt achter dat ik een bepaald tv vind. Dan maak je gewoon dat koelkoek erbij. Dan heb je jij dat en dan bedrijf je het terug. Nee, dan heb je nog een andere comment erbij. Dat is misschien ook wel goed om mee te nemen. Dan heb je nog een andere comment erbij. Uh, naast de twee minuten up, dat is dus gewoon een bootje machine, dan heb je ook een week provision. En dat is, draai nog eens een keer provisioner. Laat de machine gewoon draaien, maar draai nog een keer provisioner. Ja. En chef die, uh, 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 de chef die detecteren van oké, okay, ik moet dit installeren, is dat installeren. Oké, okay, skip ik. Hé, hey, dit, dit moet ik installeren, maar ik wel in de configuratiebestand en een keer dus bewijs. Dat betekent dat ik dit bestand wel weer opnieuw open moet zetten en maar ik komen terug herstart. Dus op het moment dat we bijvoorbeeld op een gegeven moment uh, hadden we renners nodig, dan is het niet meer werk dan het koepel erin te hangen en te zeggen van oké, okay, uh, doe even uh, een. Uh, in pool, frame provision en twee minuten later de rest erin zitten. Ja. Dus dat was voor ik, uh, Robert had het nodig. Ik was 30 minuten bezig met een goed koepel vinden en het installeren en het bijzonder aan onze bewijzen. Robert Poel heeft het. Robert Poel heeft uh, frame provision en hij heeft twee minuten later heeft hij de rest erin zitten. En dat wil ik weer niet aan. Maar jij moet het dus installeren, maar dat draait het voor de eerste keer van de fout. Dus je hebt weer een. Uh... Nee, 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 de chef die zorgt voor het voordeel. De bestaande VM wordt geüpgraded naar de, de nieuwe definitie. En dat is een alleen de stap registering. Dat was al fout. Dat gaat niet, gaat niet. 
Oké, we willen toch zo'n specifieke marktprofiguratie en we willen toch jonge kerst gebruiken. En nee, dit koopboek is beter en dat soort geinen. Dus ja. dan gooi je dus, dan is het sneller om even weg te gooien en gewoon niet op te bouwen. Want het duurt letterlijk. Ik bedoel, uh, we hebben er eentje met, met, met Redis, Solar, uh, Node.js, uh, een hele Ramban, alles erop en eraan. Dat duurt van, uh, ik heb hem uh, toevallig gisteren opnieuw gebouwd, van helemaal niks. Tot mijn uh, development VM, twee dingen op dit moment. Ja, de, de, voor een ander project heb ik eentje die is in vijf minuten klaar. Dan heb je dus van je hele lijmstek, inclusief database, configuratie, alle fixtures, alles erin. Je kunt dus letterlijk gewoon in één keer beginnen. Het ligt er ook al aan of je base works al is gedaan. Dat je... Nou goed, dat gaat snel zat. Ik bedoel, dus hoe snel kun je downloaden? Daar gaat ja. het vanaf. Dus het, uh, ik heb het zelf die andere vreemdes genomen. Dat is ook voor de downboy en je netboy van je data box. Dat zou ik ook uit die markt doen. Nee, ik heb ook niet tien projecten heb gewerkt, heb ik tien van die VM's staan. Ik heb de rest steeds niet zo groot. Ja. Dat is een beetje om dat ook te bij te stellen. Uh, ja, ja. Dan, ik ben dat weet ik niet helemaal mee eens. Nu gaat het over hoe ver je op. Ja, als je er helemaal mee bent, dan ja, ik ik leer je het nou, op, op het moment dat je VM gaat gebruiken, dan pak je toch een handbij te gebruiken. Ja, ja. Want uh, ik geloof de derde pagina staat wel, oké, VM het up. Start je ermee, VM het bal, stop je ermee, VM het destroy, je ermee weg. Volgens mij heb ik een slide voor de retext. Ja, het is met updating. 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 Oké, dat komt wel absoluut. Spelcheck, oké. Hebben we nog iets? Hebben we nog iets? Ik voel bedankt. Yo. Een kwartier, als iemand niet zo'n drinken achter het scherm. Ik denk dat je het niet voor de camera hebt. Ik zal de stream in je.
Okay, <clears throat> for the next part of our meeting, we have Robert. Um, he's going to tell us how to develop your apps the right way. Please give him an applause. Here's Robert. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, I'm going to show you uh, how to set up your uh, development script. Uh, first, I'll start with an introduction. Uh, who am I? I'm Rolt von Bovert, a developer at iBuildings. I like to call myself a web enthusiast, I think we all are. Uh, I like to travel, and uh, I call myself the average Joe because I'm just not that special. Um, <laughs> just a small disclaimer. Uh, this talk is heavily opinionated. Uh, all the tools I will mention are, um, uh, yeah, I think they are very good for the job, uh, but they are not uh, particularly the best. Uh, I just think they are uh, great for using, and I just want to show you some examples. Um, so, what are we here for? Deployment. First, start with the uh, table of contents. Uh, I'm going to tell you some horror stories to warm you up, and then I'll show you some common pitfalls. Uh, then I'll show you what we actually want to achieve at the end, and then uh, we'll start building our own script uh, from beginning to end. So, oh, and then I'll show you some integration. <laughs> um, horror stories. I just heard someone say, uh, yeah, I deploy my application with FTP, so uh, that's a good group. Um, I like to mention that FTP is not a deployment tool. Uh, FTP is a great tool for transferring files, um, but uh, it's missing a lot of features to, to uh, execute. So um, it's a great tool, and you can actually use it as part of your deployment, but on itself, it should not be uh, considered as a deployment tool. The same goes for rsync. Um, yeah, it's What's wrong with rsync? Sorry. <laughs> Don't want to insult uh, anybody, but. It's a great tool. Uh, it's, it's way quicker than uh, FTP, of course, uh, because you can synchronize your directories. Uh, still, it's not a deployment tool, but it can, again, be part of a deployment. Um, slightly better already, versioning checkout. Uh, you can SSH to your remote server, do a checkout of your uh, repository there, and uh, be done with it. But still, you miss uh, some capabilities to roll back or do migrations or whatever. This is actually a real uh, life story. Uh, I once had a customer. Uh, he told me on the telephone, yeah, sorry, my, uh, my uh, firewall uh, has been shut down. So the only thing you can do is uh, here you have a login code for TeamViewer. Uh, please log in to my Windows server. Oh, by the way, you can access all the files of our entire company. Um, and just edit it in Notepad, because you don't have privileges to install the proper tools. So yeah, I don't have to <laughs> say that's not how you should deploy your application. Um, problems and solutions. There are a lot of common pitfalls, which I guess everybody 
uh, nodes. Uh, manual operations, you want to minimize that. Um, a lot of, uh, actually Dan showed it already by setting up your uh, development environment. The same goes for uh, deployment. A lot of projects have uh, their own wiki page with a thousand lines. Uh, if you do this, then make sure that you do that. And, and yeah, make sure developers really not that confident to do the deployment. So uh, you should avoid any uh, manual operations. Um, also, slow deployment. We all know it. A lot of scripts uh, take too long or the operations take too long. Uh, downtime is also something you don't want. Um, Cache is an important topic, and uh, migrations. <coughs> and also, uh, there is, uh, uh, with a lot of deployment scripts, you don't have the possibility to go back to the point where you started, and that's something you should have. So let's start with that. Um, if you uh, do a deployment, no matter what goes wrong, you want to make sure you can go back. Um, so we need to consider that when writing our de uh, deployment script. Um, also, uh, many operations, you shouldn't do it, uh, period, just, just don't. Uh, if there's any many operation which you have to type out in your wiki page, just type it out in your deployment script. That's, in most cases, even uh, uh, the same amount of work. Uh, there is the bus factor. We all know it, right? Uh, if person X comes under a bus, then, well, actually we're fucked. Um, <laughs> like my... I made this joke last week, but I, I'm just going to test it out. Like my friend Nena says. No? OK, I'm going to leave it out because it doesn't work. <laughs> Nena, <laughs> German singer. OK. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to see. Um, confidence. This is the most important one. You want to make sure that all of your developers and everybody involved in the project um, feel confident deploying your application. So you can do it often. You can do it whenever you want. And let it be done by everybody. Uh, so that, that's an important thing. Um, this can be a bit drastic. I know that. But I would say that you should always strive for zero downtime. Uh, there are some edge cases, for example, when you do a major uh, update, which will take an hour or whatever, or maybe some criti uh, critical uh, projects cannot afford to have uh, uh, minimum, uh, uh, sorry, this is, uh, go back. Um, there are edge cases, and you want to make sure that, uh, in most cases, when you, for example, do a minor release, you want to have zero downtime. Um, so, no more on the construction pages, that's why it is here. Um, you want quick deploys, that's how you reach it, because if you have quick deploys and optimize the shit out of your uh, deployment pr process, uh, you will make sure that the uh, downtime will be minimized and also the uh, window of errors will be uh, smaller. Then you have uh, smaller releases that also make sure that you have uh, quicker deploys and again uh, less uh, error chance. Um, and you want to automate, try to automate everything. So no manual operations, what I said. Uh, everything you can do to automate it, do it. It will cost you some time in the beginning, but eventually it will uh, help you. Um, this is uh, the motto at Facebook, actually. This is on the wall. Uh, the release uh, manager there says that all developers should uh, just do quick deploys, make quick releases, do quick changes, and that's uh, uh, part of the entire process. So you make sure that your deployment will uh, um, um, cache. You should, um, if you want to um, uh, do deployments a couple of times a day, um, you don't want response times like these. Uh, if you do a, a deploy, and your application cache uh, needs a minute to warm up, you want to do that on beforehand, so before you uh, release your deployment. Uh, also, when you um, uh, want to minimize uh, the downtime and, and, and the slowness for your users, just make sure you do this on beforehand. This is also a fun one. I think we've all seen it. 
you get an email like this, please make sure that you run this in that query and that you move some files to a different directory. Um, yeah, I mean, Alex won't work here for long because this is something you should not do. You should make sure that your uh, script takes care of it. So for this, we have migrations. And I'll show you something about that uh, later on. Um, so these are the common pitfalls. This is what we don't want. And this is what we do want. We want automation, quick rollouts, zero downtime. The cache must be warmed up. Uh, we want to run migrations. And we want to have rollbacks for when something goes wrong. OK, let's start with the beginning. Um, this is a famous saying by Sun Tzu. Uh, and what I want to say with it is uh, make sure that uh, before you uh, start going uh, create your, uh, your project, and when you sit around the drawing table, you must make sure that um, you have thought about your deployment. It's, it's a, such a critical part of the development process. Uh, so you need to make sure that, that uh, you know what to do with it on beforehand. Uh, part of that is that you should manage your expectations. Um, so you should know what your customer uh, thinks. Uh, maybe your customer doesn't give a hoot. So, um, but if your customer wants uh, daily releases, you need to make sure that that happens. Also, um, your users need to be informed. So your web visitors need to see uh, special error messages, for example, when you are deploying. Uh, you need to be in one page with both your project manager and your development uh, team, and your testing team, of course, because they're all part of the release cycle. And you need to make sure that that's all uh, optimized. Also, budget is an important one, by the way. Um, so when you're thinking about your strategy, um, you need to think about your release cycle. Uh, for some projects, once a week is enough. Some want just once a month. Some want several times a day. Uh, so you need to think about that. Uh, you need to think about your service setup, um, your branching strategy, if you use a versioning system, of course. Uh, and you need to think about the tools to use. And for that, well, I already showed it. Uh, this is a quite typical setup. Um, it's called DTAP. I think everyone knows it. In Dutch, it's uh, OTAP. Uh, you start with your development uh, server, which is running on Vagrant, of course. Um, then you do your releasing. Uh, you create new features. You test it. You test it. Uh, if, if something uh, fails, you go back to the development. Uh, if, something, uh, uh, if it succeeds, you go to the next stage. That ex that's acceptance. And at the end, you go to production. Um, this, uh, if you go one step further, you can have continuous deployment. Uh, but this is just the basis for what I will uh, write the, the script with. Um, and to do all of this, I want to cut to the point. Just use Git. Um, I know there's a lot of discussion about it, but I mean it. Use Git. Uh, it's reliable. It's super fast. Uh, it has easy branching and merging. Uh, I think it's the, the quickest uh, versioning, uh, actually, which there is. Um, and that's very important because you want to have your deployment script uh, it should be as quick as possible. Um, it's distributed. A lot of people consider that as a disadvantage. I actually think that for this case it is a pro because you can set up uh, mirrored versions of your servers, and especially when you use GitHub, which is down sometimes. Um, <laughs> you, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of GitHub. <laughs> um, Actually, I think it has an awesome UI. It has a lot of extras. It has the pull request system, which can also be an important part of your uh, branching strategy. Uh, and it has a lot of integration with existing uh, uh, tools uh, related to deployments, so like uh, continuous integration, for example, with uh, Jenkins or Hudson or whatever. You can trigger it. Uh, so I, I just think that you should use it. If you don't think so, just well, come by after. <laughs> we'll see. Um, dependency management is also an important one. What if you have a framework which needs to be updated? What if you use uh, external libraries? What if you use uh, uh, QA tools or, or build tools or whatever external things you use which are integrated into your project? You need to make sure that those are easily manageable. Uh, and it's also part of your deployment. And I want to run more things. Composer. 
I think most of you uh, heard of it. It's an awesome tool. Uh, I'm not doing it in 2D, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's great for uh, updating and managing your uh, all of your dependencies just in one file. You can version it. Uh, you can uh, set it to uh, versions you want to use for all the libraries. So I think it's awesome, and you should use it for uh, stuff like this. Embrace that with a couple. And embrace that a couple of times. That's yeah. I'm not going to argue with that. That's true. Um, migrations. Uh, yeah, you can use your write, uh, write your own script. Uh, it's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can also use one of the existing ones. Uh, Doctrine migration, for example, I think it's a, it's a good one. Uh, you have dbpatch. Uh, one of my colleagues is uh, actually maintaining that. And um, yeah, of course, you can use the one shift with your framework or your ORM. Uh, in some cases, it's better to use the one that's uh, coupled with your uh, modeling. So yeah, it's no matter, but you should have a migration script. Uh, but no matter how uh, awesome your migration script is, or how good your versioning system works, just make sure you always make a backup. Um, if you're doing several uh, releases a day, you might say that you just create a backup one time. But yeah, if, if you have a small database and it costs uh, uh, not that much, you could do a backup always. Um, OK, let's talk about directory structure. Let's say this is your web root. Um, usually, you would uh, put your uh, web files in there. I would uh, say this is the best, best practice for deployments. Create a release directory. This is how a lot of tools do it, actually. I stole it. Um, you create a, uh, a unique uh, directory, which is, in this case, uh, a timestamp. And if you don't plan to do uh, multiple uh, releases a second, then you'll be good. Um, <laughs> And at the end of your uh, entire deployment script, when you executed it, uh, you just uh, create a symlink with your current. And this is actually the web root which will be used by your web server. And you symlink it to this one, and your new uh, version of your application will be online. This is, this is a very good uh, way to do that. So you make sure that uh, everything in this directory has been prepared. So you updated your versions, uh, uh, sorry, your checkouts. Uh, you updated your dependencies. You run your migrations, you uh, warm up your cache inside of this directory, and then at the end, you set the symlink. So, quick sum up. Do a backup, create new directory, update your code, update dependencies, uh, run the migrations, and then let's build it. Um, or not. You can build it, of course, if you want, but uh, I, I'm not going to do it. Actually, a lot of people uh, uh, worked on something that already works for us. Capistrano is a great tool. Uh, it's easy to set up. It's uh, task-based, so it's very easy to hook into with your own custom tasks. Uh, it's written in Ruby, and today seems like it's actually a Ruby day, because I um, also showed some Ruby examples. Um, you can use multiple servers. So uh, if you deploy, you can run the script on uh, uh, parallel uh, on several servers at the same time. And it has a multi-stage extension, which uh, uh, is perfect for uh, your DTAP setup. Uh, I'm not going into deep on Capistrano, but actually most of the stuff I will show after this uh, is part of Capistrano, so most credits go to them. Um, Capiphany is built on top of Capistrano, and it has a lot of uh, extra features for uh, Symfony. Um, you deploy with one single config. Uh, and it actually looks like this. This is how you set, uh, set the Epiphany up. You install a gem. You go to your web root. You do Epiphany install dot and be done. Now your uh, deployment script has been set up. Uh, of course, you need to configure something. So the only thing you have to do manually uh, is set up your config. Um, here, this is just application name. You uh, say uh, on the remote server, you go to this directory. That, that will be your deployment directory. Um, your domain is this. Uh, th that's also needed for the, the configuration. And uh, this is an example of how you could set up it with uh, Git. Uh, you can, of course, use GitHub or some other private server. It doesn't matter. Uh, it has good support for um, authorization and everything related to it. So uh, don't be scared. Also, um, if you configure it, 
you go uh, again to your webroot, you run uh, cap deploy setup, and uh, this will actually run your configuration on your remote server. So it will set up uh, the deployment on your server. It will create the directory structure and, and set up some privileges. Um, and after that, it's only this. Uh, whenever you want to do a uh, deploy, you just run cap deploy and be done. That, that's actually it. Uh, I know I shouldn't do it, and everybody told me not to do it, but I'm actually <laughs> going to show you uh, especially exclusive for PHP Benelux live deployment. Uh, this is also important to know. If you did something <laughs> wrong, uh, you can just do cap deploy rollback. That's one of the many tasks it has. And it will automatically roll back to a previous version uh, uh, you had. So uh, the multi-staging extension. Uh, this is a cool one, I think. Uh, you can set up several environments. It's, it's unlimited, so you can uh, do it however you want. I just uh, t took a basic setup uh, DTAP again in reverse. Um, you can set up a default stage, so you're sure that you're always, uh, if you forget, forget to type the stage, then you will go to the test server, so that's not that bad. Um, you just set your uh, configuration there, and inside of that configuration there, uh, you put files like this. So this is actually the only thing you need for setting up a different stage. So I say here, test, um, this is my server, uh, set some uh, variables, this is actually needed for Symfony to run uh, in test mode, and be done. Uh, again, cap deploy, test, and it will run on the test server. So that's uh, very easy to set up and very powerful. I'm just going to quickly run through some things because I think. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, this is uh, for uh, your model manager. You can uh, run your migrations and, and set up uh, some stuff. It's just convenience. Uh, you can set it to doctrine. Um, this is something when you use uh, Composer, you should set the update vendors to false because it will try to update your vendors directory uh, manually by just calling git pull or git update or whatever. Uh, so you can set use Composer true, and you can even set the mode which it should run in. Uh, I always set it to install, uh, and then your Composer will uh, automatically be run after your uh, deployment. Uh, also, uh, it has support for a lot of Symfony, uh, uh, Symfony commands, like uh, dump a sag. This will just, uh, it's again with caching, it will just dump some files to some web directory. Uh, and it doesn't need to be done uh, when a user visits your web page. Um, this is how you set up uh, shared directories. I, I just showed you the releases directory. Um, it will also create a shared directory in which it will store, uh, for example, user data, uh, temp files, maybe uh, log files. So all the things you don't want to be erased when you do a new, uh, new deploy. Uh, and uh, as last, you can set writable directories here. It's just straightforward. Uh, this is a cool one. Um, this one will set the number of directories you will keep uh, when you do a cleanup. So all the directories you showed before, uh, in this case, only three will, will remain after your deployment uh, cleanup. Uh, user permissions, I think I'm going to skip this one. Um, it's fairly straightforward. You just want to set it up. Um, set it to some generic user which you will uh, log in uh, with. Um, and here you set, you, yeah, you can just do a lot of stuff like this. Uh, you can set the permission method even. Um, they say ACL is the best. But I have no experience with it, so I just use a change mod. Um, and this one is important, actually, because I forgot that and was wondering why this didn't work. So you should set permissions to true. Um, yeah, this is something I consider uh, as best practice. You should never use sudo uh, for your deployment script, because it's automated, and you want control over your script. And uh, well, maybe there's something you've t mistyped, or uh, just make sure that, that it doesn't have root rights. OK, uh, I know I just said that you shouldn't do uh, new structure pages. Uh, of course, there are some cases where you need it. Uh, and even when something breaks and you're, you have to investigate what went wrong, or maybe even your rollback doesn't work, uh, you need to make sure there is a fallback. And, and you should create a maintenance page. 
So, uh, uh, Capistrano has a good feature for that. You do deploy web disable. Um, you can even set a region in Mateo, and it will just uh, uh, replace your web directory with a blank screen uh, with this text. It's not really fancy, so if you want to override the template, uh, you can even uh, do that. So just create your own HTML file and be done with it. You, it will show you a fancy fail will or whatever. Um, OK, just some small uh, tips and tricks. Uh, this is a cool one. Uh, here you can say, um, uh, normally you would set set branch in your config file, and then it will take some branch from your uh, uh, Git repository. Uh, in this case, it will ask you for the, um, the hash. So you can um, put in a, a branch, or a commit hash, or even a tag, or whatever, uh, anything unique that will identify with, with Git. Of course, this only works with Git, but um, I already said you should use it. Um, <laughs> I'll show you in a minute uh, how this works, but this is how it uh, looks like. So we do a uh, start. And uh, then the first thing it will ask you, make sure to push the tag first. This is just a warning for yourself. Uh, this is actually the last tag on your branch that it selects automatically by default, so you don't have to type in anything if you don't want to. Uh, in this case, I say, no, I just want to deploy the last master revision. And uh, yeah, that will work for, for you. Oh, this is uh, LibreOffice again. Sorry about that. Next week, I will do it with PowerPoint. Um, OK, just some, uh, some quick tips. Uh, this is very convenient if you uh, use GitHub, for example, with uh, SSH keys. Uh, this first option you should uh, set because it will, uh, uh, sorry, this is the second one. This will forward your agent keys. Uh, the first one is your, uh, uh, when something asks for a permission, for example, or for a password. Uh, you should enable this one because uh, then you can <laughs> put in your user input. Um, this is also a convenient one. Uh, after you deploy, this is how you set up a task. After deploy, deploy cleanup, and it will just erase all the directories except for the last three ones. Um, this we also do in our project. After update code, doctrine migrations migrate, so it will uh, do your migration directly after the code update. Um, and this is how you run any Symfony uh, command. It's quite handy to know. So what's next? I think uh, Dan already uh, told a lot about this, so I'll keep it short. If you want to uh, manage your environment, so not your, only your uh, dependencies, but also your system, uh, you should uh, use something for provisioning. And I think, uh, yeah, a setup like Chef is the best. You can also integrate that in your script. Um, so in this case, you could say, after update code, provision, and then create your own task run Chef Solo. In this case, I do it with sudo, uh, because you need, of course, uh, a root rights for updating your, uh, your system. Uh, and this will just run automatically after your script, which I'm going to show you. Um, OK, bear with me, because this is dangerous. Dun, dun, dun. OK, let's say I have a, uh, oh, you didn't see it. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Stupid yeah. me. OK, let's say this is my log. Then look at the messages, please. Um, and my last uh, ta uh, commit, I want to tag. So I say tag minus a um, sum tag. Um, test. OK. Remember, we first have to push it. And there it is, hold my. OK. I've pushed my tag. And now I do a cap deploy. So now you see I, I have debugging enabled. So you see all output uh, uh, that is logged in here. Um, you see that it now automatically uh, selects my, my last tag. I hit enter, and now the magic happens. Oh. So while you do this, you can get a beer or a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, <coughs> okay, now you see it will update your uh, vendor directory with the uh, uh, composer. That's done. It's generating some other load files. Install your assets for Symfony. It's uh, warming up the cache now. You see how fast that is? Okay, the cache warm-up is not that fast, but that was the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, this is so this is uh, this was actually the deploying part, now it's going to run chat. And it needs my password, so password, password, password. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this will throw a lot of output, actually. Yeah, now it's broken. Okay, the chef part takes a, takes a while, but that's because we're using a lot of libraries. Okay, it's done. Did anybody forfeit, by the way? It sits there, six seconds. Chef. Oh, chef! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, four seconds. Uh, this is exciting. Okay, I will fast forward this part uh, in the final uh, screen capture. Okay, so now it's going to run Duck Three migrations. Uh, it's running some stuff for our own scripts and done. So my new version is now on the test server uh, with everything warmed up, everything updated. Um, and in exactly the same environment as my development machine in the same commit. So, I think I can go here. Uh, okay, now I have to go to the first thing you need to do. Seriously. It's a Mac. It's a Mac. Is it uh, yeah. GitHub? Eh, uh, 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 <laughs> sure do. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. That was it. Uh, does anybody have questions? Yeah. Um, so if you switch uh, uh, um, versions by uh, uh, moving a symbolic link, where do the user uploads go? Uh, you put them in a the shared directory. Uh, I showed it a couple of slides ago. Uh, you can define in Capistrano that you have a shared directory, mm -hmm. and that directory uh, uh, you can uh, store your. Uh, it, it will also create a symlink. Uh, I forgot to mention that. Mm -hmm. So from within your new uh, uh, release directory, it will create some symlinks for the, the directories you marked as shared, and they are actually in the shared directory. Does that make sense? Instead of the releases directory. Yeah. Well, uh, somewhere in the beginning of the presentation, says about never having to enter uh, over the top. Uh, 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 you know, with manual input through work, it should be automated completely. So now I have to enter my, my branch. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's logical <laughs> in, in a sense. But then you have to wait, because somewhere halfway during your, your hour long deployment process, yeah. you have to sit there and be ready to enter your branch. Isn't it possible to set the branch is actually at the beginning. The branch is through that. Shall I run it again? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was at the beginning yet? Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I think you're mistaken with the uh, uh, pseudopod yeah, for Chef. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, that's something, uh, it, it, it goes against each other. Because I said, you shouldn't use pseudo, uh, but for Chef, you need pseudo to update your uh, library. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah. But, okay. yeah. It's, it, ha it has happened that I was getting a cup of coffee and went to the toilet and came back, ah, oh, come on, the chef has to run again. 
Yeah. That was too much information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the multi-staging extension. Uh, does it come bundled, or do you need to install it manually? Uh, actually, I actually think it's part of Capistrano. Okay. I think it comes with Epiphany, but you have to install separately. Yeah, indeed. It is a well. separate extension. Yeah. And what's the process to install? It's a gem. Uh, yeah. Ruby gem. Yeah. Okay, so just a gem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think I told you that people do this, but I just thought of something. Yeah. Um, if you load, if you run Chef to uh, configure your server, yeah. Then at that point, um, either the old version won't work properly, the new version. Maybe because you change a version, yeah, of yeah. Some, some library. It's the same with your grid. So yeah, this is yeah. This we talked about this yesterday during lunch. Uh, actually. Yeah. So and this can take a while because it needs uh, a network to load uh, a lot of <coughs> versions for uh, packaging. So this is one of the uh, points at which you want to have uh, um, a construction page. Yeah. This epiphany uh, put this on a construction page at this. Moment in time, or you can do it yourself. Uh, you can easily hook on into the events. So there, there are a lot of them. So you can say, I do everything uh, here. In my examples after update code. But you could, for example, say before run migrations or something like that, and then uh, or before before run chef, yeah. and then you can update your uh, uh, your code or sorry your uh, maintenance page, and after that, then you do after this or that. Uh, disable the, the page again. Yeah, because that's something I, I agree that this goes for that part. Yeah. This is an opinionated block, okay? You say yeah. zero time time, but there is actually a, a downtime. Yeah, well, that was the part where I got off a bit. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I would say <laughs> just try to minimize it by, and you minimize as far as you can by using this kind of deployment. Exactly, yeah. yeah. No, I, I think the distinction you should make is uh, between minor and major releases. I think. I think nobody will do a, a, a PHP upgrade to, from 5.3 to 5.4 uh, within a, a minor update. So yeah, no, I think they do it between releases, actually. But it doesn't really matter. So, I mean, if yeah. you have, say, you say uh, before this, after this, I have the, uh, the maintenance page up. If your deployment is so quick, it's never up in practice. So you could just build it in there for yeah. safety. Yeah. And if it takes longer, you can have it up. I mean, that would that be, that'd be you never have the broken situation. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to say that a lot of people think that uh, when you uh, enable a new restriction page, it's not a guarantee that your um, um, that your customers see that that your application is broken, because this goes way further. If you have an Ajax application, for example, you need to make sure that um, when people are doing asynchronous requests. And they see uh, a working application that actually even your JavaScript should fetch that and show something to the user that something went wrong. No, okay, but now you have a points. Your Apache could be down, or 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 you have 500 errors. Because yeah, you're yeah. Creating something heavy. I mean, that's that also affects mobile clients or whatever. Yeah, that's true. It's, yeah, but I'm just saying the, the other is also not the perfect answer. No, at least if you show that you think about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would say. Uh, There's a phone number. I mean, I mean, you don't have to just enable the under construction page. You can also create uh, some custom script, which will uh, set a maybe an environment variable, uh, which will be fetched by your error handler. So when something does go wrong, it will show your uh, user that something went wrong because you're deploying or something like that. I, I don't know. It's a uh, it, it's a very gray area, I guess. It's uh I mean, for, it's, this this talk is more about your regular daily uh, deploys, I guess. So the you just. Job. <laughs> but everybody should. Yeah. No. Oh, 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 we do it. Just in between, I mean, <coughs> just move away from the whole shift part. If people get down to the more minimal level, for instance, you just run uh, database migrations. You don't install everything new, but you check out your code. Your code is assumed to have a new database set up, which is not there yet because you still need to run the migrations. So at that point, the mapping between your code and your database might be. Yeah. Even though it might just be for those two seconds, in those two seconds, anything can break if you've got to have an itchy screen with the application or a yeah, so, so, Yeah, that requires some 
to be better to steal either those only two seconds. Have the, you can, could you use a PHP template to score that? Yeah, one? yeah. Quake if you want. Uh, just create a simple, uh, even though you, you minimize your downtime to, to a fraction of a second or a couple of seconds, it might be better to have a, a downtime handler rather than nothing at all. Yeah. Dat punt is volgens mij weer om te maken dat je moet streven naar die zero down, ja. dat je wilt trainen. Ja. En nu krijg je een discussie of dat wel of niet kan, maar. Nou, het is, ja, ja, het is wel goed. Het, het is een goede discussie, hè? Ja, dat is maar ik wil je uitdagen laten. Maar natuurlijk moet je dingen treffen, omdat het een keer een heel is. Hoe dat zegt hij? Ja, hij moet het in de constatie. Ja, die training is kansen, ja, die is heel goed. Dat is een heel goed oefenen dan. Ja. Hij heeft een kwestie. Is it also possible to uh, kind of delay the request or the response? Yeah, you point that time? Ooh. Ooh. You just start times out. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I actually talked with a guy last week which, uh, which wrote something like that once. Uh, it was really complicated. Well, you um, can just write, write a service that accepts any of your URLs that your, your application or API supports. Yeah. It's timed out after a long time, which is longer than your deployment. And that's so it just won't work, but it won't break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want a, I don't want a timeout, a guaranteed timeout. I want uh, like a time request, request, to request, to a little short. request to like wait at least um, uh, thirty seconds, uh, and maybe if the uh, app is up by that time, then it gets the new um, the, the, the normal request. Yeah. 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 Uh, it exists with a couple of things. Uh, when Go, for, for example, has this in the mod swap capability, but uh, I think the barrier here really is a lot of the web server. And if you have to upgrade the web server, yeah, but just just to, to get this whole discussion short, it's it's implementation details. I mean, this script just provides you with the, the the proper hooks and the events for doing stuff like this, but you can make it as uh, crazy as you want yourself. So I think that's that's the main point actually. Uh, I got a little bit more like feedback, but uh, are you going to do the live demo at DPC as well? No. Okay. Definitely because not. I, I, I saw the branches coming by, and we have a lot of American visitors there as well. Yeah. It wouldn't be good to have a my PMS branch in. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually really sharp, really sharp. We were laughing for that last week. Yeah. Uh, I created it, I typed it, and when I pushed it, I was like, Okay, I just pushed my PMS to uh, to reserve. <laughs> okay, yeah. We should explain actually. By the way, PMS is a, is a term from our client, which stands for uh, process uh, process models. Yeah, my process models. It is. So, yeah. <laughs> it's the name of the feature. Yeah, my PMS. Waarom leert hij deze wild blockchain? I I want to do a screen capture indeed. Uh, so. <laughs> screen capture. Uh, maybe uh, also my my copy for create some 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 uh, really simple visuals. Uh, if you see like I'm deploying from here to there and and, and do this magic and da da da, uh, maybe make some really simple graphics. And yeah, people are, are gra graphic. They like graphic. I mean, not really people like, but if you see a graphic, you you understand. The, the whole concept. Yeah. If you have the, the, the drive, like yeah, that's true. you have to think of in your mind, oh yeah, it goes like this. And if you see the graphic, it's oh, yeah. 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 really visualized. Yeah. And if you see the text, exactly. you start reading and you stop listening. You, yeah. you say you, you made it. Yeah, I, I noticed also at the end there was too much uh, text. You yeah. see uh, open office, uh, I, I bet open office, there's some, some really uh, uh, simple server graphics. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. And you just uh, an, arrow, an arrow between it and space. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to do that. Yeah, sure. And you have you all you, you, your text is on the left side, uh, so you uh, you always you always have your your right side yeah. uh, 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 free, and you put the top right side, so your your screen is filled. Yeah. Maybe I can give you a tip on that. Once I start my <coughs> presentations, I start with a lot of bullet lists. I start to break them down, put each bullet in a new slide, and then find a graphic for it. And just use the bullet text as yeah, the title. Yeah, I actually slide. talked about that before, but it, uh, it makes it even harder to, um, 
because you need really need to uh, sh uh, know your sh slides. Yeah. And as some of you might have mentioned, I was a bit nervous. So. And, um, and, and also, drifts uh, uh, are nice, and, and you have those those uh, fun graphics, and it's it's also nice to have those in your talk once, maybe twice, but mm -hmm. just make sure that it's not all fun graphics, mm -hmm. uh, because yeah, then, then no no offense, but then you're 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 making it too light and, and too. Um, yeah, it's, how, how do, how do I, I do it, it on purpose, on purpose uh, just at the beginning, so it's just yeah, a little... Yeah, uh, but, but just don't do it too much, I think. Yeah, yeah. Keep it this way. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if this is applicable. Um, yeah, uh, Twitter, if somebody wants to follow me. Um, I actually forgot to... We, we do have code, right? No? Code. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we will tweet it later on. We, can, yeah. uh, we use the same one for last week. Or. Yeah. It's, I'm not sure that the most, most of the people here are from Idol. <laughs> okay. Um, ah, the trade. Can I have a cash? <laughs> we'll do it later on. Uh, <laughs> This is uh, for some further reading. If uh, people find this topic interesting, there's a lot written about this. Um, so just, yeah. I don't know if you want to uh, type it over, but yeah. I'll, I'll put the slide somewhere. Further reading. Get yourself an Amazon affiliation link. Put the uh, links on your slides. Yeah. People click on it, and you get the money. Is that so? Hmm. That's a good idea. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That concludes the meeting for today. Um, we still have some breaks left, so if you want to stay and chat uh, with one of the speakers or we each other, that's fine. I want to thank iBuildings for hosting this meeting. Please give an applause to iBuildings. Yeah. <laughs> we will have our next meeting uh, in June, uh, also again in New Zealand uh, at Bakshul. Uh, I hope to see you there again. Thank you. Thank you.